This is Steve Zeltzer with Pacifica and Workweek. I'm with Sean Crawford, who's a member of the UAW 598 GM Flint Truck Assembly. He's been active in the uh, past strike of the General Motors. And also with Frank Hammer, who is a retired member of the UAW in Detroit. And we are in the midst of a, a primary tomorrow. What are the issues facing auto workers in Michigan? And what do you feel are the important issues that, that they will be thinking about when they vote tomorrow? I mean, the fact that Joe Biden voted for all the trade deals that have you know, pretty much been screwing us since I was a kid, Joe Biden supported him. Bernie Sanders is always opposed him. So from, from my perspective, that's one of the main reasons that Bernie Sanders is the best candidate to, to help this community in this area. And we're listening to Sean Crawford, who's a member of UAW 598, General Motors in Flint. And uh, Joe Biden has said that he bailed out the auto plants during uh, the recession, and that, that was uh, important for auto workers. You don't buy that argument? Uh, I mean, sure, the Obama administration did do some positive things, and I'm not trying to take away from that, but, you know, that was more Obama's accomplishment than Biden's. You know, you can't take, uh, I can't take credit for your accomplishments, even though we're friends, right? It doesn't make any sense. So the credit Biden with that kind of uh, accomplishment to me doesn't really hold a whole lot of water. What you got to do is you got to look at his past record and how he voted. Look at the facts. You know, he was one of the architects of the war on drugs, the, you know, the prison industrial system. I mean, all that came out of, you know, Joe Biden. He called George Bush Sr. too conservative in the war on drugs. So, you know, if you want to talk about mass incarceration and things of that nature, Joe Biden is one of the worst people out there. So, uh, but I, I digress. No, I, I believe that Bernie Sanders has shown consistently through his record that he's the best candidate on trade. And we're talking with Sean Crawford, a UAW member. And Frank Hammer, you're on the line as well. I mean, there was just the recent uh, U.S.-Mexico uh, uh, Canada trade agreement, USMCA. Uh, what was the, the difference between um, Biden and Sanders on that? So the only uh, presidential candidate on the Democratic field in this round that took a stand against the recently, uh, you know, uh, resuscitated NAFTA, the only candidate was was uh, was uh, Bernie Sanders. All the other candidates on the uh, Democratic d- debate stage uh, were in support of Trump, which is just staggering. Were in support of Trump and in support of the new uh, USMCA uh, with Mexico. Now, I think what's critical is that uh, Sanders not only opposed the agreement, but on the grounds upon which he did it. And it was uh, it showed uh, to me that he sees an organic link between something called trade or free trade or trade agreements and one of his prime concerns, which has to do with the question of the climate crisis that uh, is engulfing the planet. And when he declared his opposition on that stage, he said it was because that trade agreement did not include one reference to the question of climate change. And the reason it's so critical is because that free trade agreement, the USMCA, gives a green light for the fossil fuel industry to exploit the oil resources in Mexico with no uh, no restraint, no regulation. Uh, so he was uh, doesn't he wasn't just saying it. He understood what it was, what it was and what its impact will be, not only on the U.S. but obviously on the planet. And this it was uh, Frank Hammer. And the issue of the future of the auto industry. There's a move for electric automobiles and electric vehicles, mass transportation. Do you think that the kind of changes that uh, auto workers need and workers in this country in general are going to take place under this Democratic Party? That's a real question. Whether they're going to make the changes because the Democratic Party uh, has been getting money from the same uh, billionaires uh, that run these industries. You know, Frank and I were talking about this exact subject before you called, and, and the thing is, like, Joe Biden is only going to do the absolute minimum as far as climate change. I mean, it's going to be just enough for him to put it on a campaign flyer. You know, for the big systemic change that we need, we need things like a Green New Deal. And people say, oh, wait, you know, Green New Deal, that'll kill our jobs. But people don't understand that it's got a 
job guarantee in the bill for living wages in the bill. These are the things that uh, we need to press and that we can make happen if we have the vision to do it, right? And so from my perspective, right, you might be moving to electric vehicles, but the only way that electric vehicles will cut the greenhouse emissions that we need them to is if the, elect- the electricity they're getting for their batteries are from renewable green sources. And to actually transition to, to, to making a, a, you know, an economy where we get most of our energy from renewable green resources, we're going to need solar panels and wind turbines, that, you know, everywhere and everyone's lot. I mean, we live in, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, a largely suburban and, and rural country. We can make this happen if we have the vision. And the thing about it, it's a jobs bill. Once we start doing that on a massive scale, unemployment can be wiped out on the level that we had during the war effort in World War II. There's no reason that we can't do that again today if we take this serious enough uh, to merit uh, this kind of response that this crisis justifies. And today the stock market collapsed 2,000 points uh, when the uh, when stock trading started. Uh, Frank, you were just at an international auto workers conference. This collapse of the economy, uh, this economic crisis, this political crisis, where do auto workers and workers in, in Michigan and around this country fit into that? So, uh, yes, I, I attended an international uh, workers, auto workers conference in, uh, it was in South Africa, and it was just, uh, it, it really, it happened just at the point where this uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak uh, was occurring, and uh, honestly, the conference didn't have an opportunity to address the, the crisis, uh, the financial crisis that's uh, following in the wake of the coronavirus, uh, and we were already talking about the crisis that faces in, 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 the auto workers are faced with internationally for the very reason that... Uh, that uh, the auto, the automobile industry in itself is in crisis for for the fact of its uh, transition uh, that is making to uh, 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 automobility and uh, and uh, uh, new the the fact that uh, the the new factories, the factories that we have ongoing are robotized or automated, and that uh, there's plant closure after plant closure. I heard from workers all over the world that it's the mode, the mod- that what we saw during uh, what was highlighted during our, the GM strike, which has to do with temporary work and the status of a temporary worker, is international in scope. It's being used, that model is used in every country where we're making a precarious work and that workers are marginalized and don't know from one day to the next what their what their future holds for them and it was clearly expressed it came from workers in india it came from uh, workers in the philippines indonesia from italy you name it we're all identifying that we're in a, in a global industry that it's in a severe crisis and the coronavirus is only going to sub complement uh that that situ- or you know uh, make that situation much worse uh, by virtue of the supply chains being broken. I mean, we talked so much about the fact that the supply chains international and clearly uh, what's happening with the coronavirus and the spread, and spread is going to affect that supply chain. And I anticipate there are going to be a lot of layoffs globally in the auto industry. And we're listening to Frank Hammer, a uh, retired UAW activist and leader in Detroit, and also with us is Sean Crawford. Well, Sean, in Korea right now, auto, auto plants are shut down. There's a wor- workers are worried about coronavirus. What is General Motors doing to protect the workers at your plant and, from coronavirus, and what is in place to protect uh, auto workers in this country? Well, um, I want to piggyback on something that Frank mentioned about temporary workers, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that, Frank, because, you know, in my heart, that's what the strike was all about. We wanted justice for our temporary workers. You know, we have people, I work with them every day, you know, two, three, four, five, six years, temporary workers. And that's just the company's way of showing you that you're disposable. They don't need you. You're there as a commodity to be used up. And after they've used you up and destroyed your body, they can just throw you away. And that's why they want more and more of the workforce to be temporary workers. I think that's key. But the truth of the matter is, that's how it is for everybody in the economy who doesn't have a strong union and a strong contract, which is why we need to have an expansion. 
expanded, reinvigorated labor movement that gives us the security we need to support ourselves and our families. And so to answer your question, as far as the coronavirus is concerned, I mean, you know, it. okay, so how our uh, sick leave works, either you can take FMLA, which is unpaid, or you can do kind of a company-sponsored sick leave, but it's also unpaid. And so for people who are, uh, you know, living paycheck to paycheck or who are temporary workers and feel they're in a more precarious situation without job stability and a contract, they're not going to take time off because they can't afford it and they know they can get fired at any moment. And that's how it is, to, to be honest, and for most people in our economy. So, I mean, we shouldn't have the president of the United States out there saying to the public, oh, well, some people are fine, just go to work, it's no big deal. Like, uh, no, sorry, this is a pandemic, all right? People need to stay home and take care of themselves and their families and their communities. But it shows you yet again how we are just tools in this economic system for capital, and when we stop producing capital for them, they can just throw us, throw us away, and that's disgusting. And there is a crisis in the UAW. Some newspapers, corporations who want the government to take over the UAW, uh, the UAW leadership, or many of it, are in prison or threatened with indictment. Uh, what has the UAW done in relationship to uh, Bernie Sanders and, and uh, uh, Biden, uh, Joe Biden? Have they had a survey of what the UAW members think about what they should do politically? So uh, let me. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Sean answer that, but let me come back to your, your previous question uh, in regards to the coronavirus. So you asked about what's GM doing, right? So I went, I went on the web and to see what I could find about GM. <laughs> He's, they got something that they put up on March 9th, uh, which was yesterday. Um, today. today, I'm sorry, and it says updated GM facility visitor procedures, right? So it's kind of cautionary work for visitors, but in, in keeping with what uh, Sean was just saying, it doesn't say anything about, well, what about the workers, right? So, and as far as the UAW is concerned on that score, the only thing I've uh, picked up uh, from the UAW is that they put out an advisory uh, cautioning uh, UAW uh, representatives from uh, taking flights and, you know, and such. But again, I didn't see any uh, circular about what, uh, what uh, UAW members should do to protect themselves from the, uh, you know, the spread of the, uh, of the coronavirus. So, uh, you know, we're very much relegated to, you know, the workers are relegated very much to, you know, n- no attention at all. So in other uh, words, what, what you're saying, Frank and Sean, is that the General Motors uh, and the UAW are basically not doing anything to prepare to defend the workers on the plant floor uh, about this coronavirus, how they can protect themselves and protect their families uh, uh, in, in this uh, very dangerous situation. And that's true, but unfortunately, it's not just auto workers, it's the economy as a whole. You know, it, it's the capitalist class on the whole that's doing this to their workforce. You know, and that's why we, it's not just people who have strong unions, but people who are non unionized need to unionize so they can protect themselves, right? And so, but it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of work. And um, as far as your question about what the UAW has been doing on the election, I have to give two specific shout-outs. Uh, you know, <laughs> first of all, uh, you know, the UAW has been incredibly corrupt. And that's been very disappointing. It's been breaking my heart. I'm, I'm sad to see the members lose faith in our union like they have been. But despite that, there have been some bright spots. For example, the former UAW president, Bob King, actually went to a rally uh, and spoke out in support of Bernie Sanders, and I was, you know, it, it kind of, it made me feel better about it. Maybe there's hope in the leadership. There are some good people that will, uh, you know, speak up for what is right. Um, and, and I'm kind of curious, though, why hasn't Cindy Estrada come out and supported Bernie Sanders this time around like she did in 2016? I thought that was a brave and bold stance. Why doesn't she do it again, you know? Is it because of what's going on with the corruption? Is she scared to stick her neck out? But that's the kind of leadership we need if we're going to transform this country. So you feel that this present leadership is so tied up in, in the systemic corruption in the union that they really can't take a stand for the auto workers? Is that what you're saying, Sean? Well, that's, that's what it feels like from my perspective. I mean, people don't really have a whole lot of respect for the international UAW leadership. Maybe some people still feel close to their local leadership because, fortunately, we do have local democracy in the UAW, and anyone can run for a position and win on the plant level. And so some people do still love their local leadership, but on 
a national level, you don't hear anything uh, positive about the IUAW. People have totally lost faith because every successive leader that's been appointed by the administration caucus has promised they have a clean sort of agenda. Then when it comes down to it, they're just as corrupt as the last bunch over and over again. And it's because it's a crony driven, uh, you know, insular system where just this little click, like a one party state, decides everything. And we have to break that down and make the national UAW just as democratic as the locals are in the UAW. And that's how we can bring a new leadership that will hopefully actually represent the workers with, you know, a bold vision for what we can achieve. And you're listening to Sean Crawford, a member of uh, UAW 598 GM Flint Truck Assembly Plant. And there is a, a struggle in the UAW to have a constitutional convention. Scott Holison in the Ford plant in UAW plant in Chicago is involved. What are rank and file members in the UAW trying to do as far as restructuring the UAW to make it more democratic? So in the wake of the GM strike, which saw a lot of rank and file initiative, uh, really striking to see how much uh, workers uh, on their own built up solidarity uh, across company lines in support of the strike. And I think that, that, that wave, uh, at the same time as we have these uh, one after another uh, UAW top leadership, you know, plead guilty to charges of embezzlement and racketeering and so on, that the combination of those two things have generated a movement among rank-and-file workers that has been captured uh, in the uh, formation of the UAWD, Unite All Workers for Democracy. Uh, it's beginning to coalesce around the uh, drive for uh, member uh, one member one vote elections in the UAW as a means by which to clean house and to establish new leadership in the UAW. Uh, so that's a that's a momentum that's uh, that's been growing. Uh, there's been a significant effort. There have been resolutions and motions passed at various local unions, local unions that are by and large controlled by the international, uh, the administration caucus leadership, the corrupt leadership, and in defiance of that caucus, uh, workers have been able to pass motions calling for a special convention and calling for uh, one member, one vote. So I think that's a very promising uh, show uh, of, of rank and file democracy, and uh, it'll be important to support that, and it'll be important for that to, to develop an agenda that uh, will develop a, a, you know, a, a democratic and fight UAW going forward. I think that the, the Democratic corporate establishment is really ganging up on him uh, here in the state of Michigan. I mean, they're bringing in Booker and they're bringing in uh, Harris and they're bringing, I mean, they're just bringing in their little army of uh, wannabes that are going to be here in support of uh, uh, Biden. And I think that, in, that uh, the, the flavor that I'm getting is that there's enough They've stoked enough fear about a Sanders victory and a Sanders, a Sanders unable to go match up against Trump that they're really build, beating the, the drums for, uh, for a Biden victory. And what they don't realize, and I think that they're going into a, like a self, uh, like a complete denialism about the next day if uh, Biden wins, which it looks like it's, at this point it looks likely here in Michigan, that they're going to be stuck with a candidate that's going to be absolutely shredded by Trump in the fall. That's what I'm seeing. Okay, well, I want to thank both of you, uh, Sean Crawford, UAW 598 GM Flint a Truck Assembly Plant worker, and Frank Hammer, a retired long-term activist in the UAW, and to talking about the issues facing uh, auto workers, workers in this country, really, coming up to the primary in Michigan. So thanks for joining us on Pacifica.